folks with that, I want to say, hey, Jake, man, welcome to the Survival Podcast. Hey, Jack. I'm excited to be here, I think. You think? We're going <laughs> to torment you a little bit today. I'm going to like open it for questions at some point. We're just going to pound you with them. For those that are new to Jake Robinson, he likes to ask questions in the middle of other people's presentations. We're not actually going to do that today because these people, unlike you, at a workshop can't be disruptive because all they can do is type comments in. So you're going to get on. I can't even see the comments, so. Oh, uh, well, you can see comments if I let you. So you can see them pop up like that. Oh, okay. That's fine. Well, I know Brian, Brian Young is not going to be on the day, so nothing can phase me. <laughs> so, hey, for, for people that maybe don't know Jake Robinson, tell us a little bit about your background. Um, that's a big part of what we're going to talk about today. But let, let's go back to, like, high school shit or whatever. And how, you, how did you end up just doing what you did professionally? Uh, just so people right. kind of get connected with you personally, for those that don't know you, who haven't had the extreme displeasure of meeting you yet. Well, I, I thought I wanted to be an electrical engineer, so I went to came out of high school, I went to college. I dropped out uh, after a couple of years, didn't like it. I kept thinking to myself, I hate electrical engineering in, in the school, but maybe if I get a degree in it and I go out and start working it, I'll like it. I'm like, well, wait a minute, what if I don't like it? I wasted four years of my life. What I really wanted to do was become an actor, and that was not really, you know, cool with my parents because they're like, what? And uh, I literally dropped out of uh, college, and I moved to Nashville and became an actor. I actually snagged a speaking role with Jessica Lange and Ed Harris, and I had my 15 minutes of fame. And I could have probably gone on and and maybe possibly become successful. That movie was the first movie uh, John Goodman was in. And we actually read for the same role. He got he got a, a different part than me, and that was his first silver screen. So I maybe could have done it, but I look back now and say I'm so damn glad I didn't become famous because I don't want to be chased by paparazzi. Believe it or not, it could happen, right? I mean, even Alec Baldwin, as a dick as he is, he gets paparazzi around him. So anyway, uh, I came I, I, I came to my senses and I, I kind of discovered sales. Uh, I read a book called Guerrilla Marketing by J. Conrad Levinson. It was the first business book I'd ever read. And it just opened my mind up to marketing and entrepreneurship and things of that nature. And so I started looking for opportunities like that. And I bounced around in a bunch of different sales jobs. Um, You know, it's it's hard to find something you can really sink your teeth into. And I um, wound up... getting involved in a three-way partnership and franchise Papa John's Pizza. I moved from Nashville, Tennessee up to Maryland. Oh my God. Uh, That was an (laughs) eye-opener. I stood in line to get a permit to put in our overhead um, uh, uh, vent for our our pizza ovens. And the guy in front of me got turned down because, uh, for a, a septic tank cause, uh, or for a, a, he was adding a bedroom to his basement. And they said, I'm sorry, uh, you can't do it because you, your septic tank's not big enough. You'll have to, you would have to get a, a second septic tank or a bigger one. And the guy behind me was getting a permit to build a doghouse. Like, crap, this is like bureaucracy city. So I got, I started learning about the state back then, but of course I couldn't get enough of it back then. I was plugged into the matrix. Anyway, I, I had sold out my partnership, came back to Tennessee. I knew a guy that was in financial services and yeah, I was a financial liar, but actually um, was in, connected with a guy that launched Dave Ramsey. So if you at least think that Dave Ramsey's idea of get out of debt and invest your money and that kind of thing, and buy term life insurance, which is what I offer. Then I did, I did, I think I did a good service for folks. I was in that business for about, well, I'm still in it technically. I was in it a good 20 years. And then the company opened up in England back in 2003. I went to England, uh, opened up. We're like a franchise, so we're an independent contractor. So I didn't have to go. It's like, oh, you need to go to England. We raised our hand. My, my wife's parents are from England. Uh, they're from Manchester, England. Then they moved to Manchester, Tennessee, which is kind of strange. And so anyway, I, uh, I wound up over there for three years, and then our parent company pulled the plug on us. We were doing pretty good, actually, and uh, I kind of got discouraged by that when I came back, so I put a lot of effort. I had about 100 people in my business that I hired and trained. I had some people that uh, were, you know, had bet their life on this opportunity that I was with, 
and just kind of frustrated. I came back, but what I did see when I was there was three years of womb to the tomb nanny state that uh, I was exposed to. Like every anytime you had anything, any conversation with anybody over there about anything, it's like, well, the government should do something about that. We need to do something. Somebody needs to do something about that. Like, why? So I came back thinking, man, I, I don't want our country to I seem like that could be the path we're on. So when I came back, I thought it would be a smart idea to get involved in politics. <laughs> I mean, and at that time, you were like scared shitless, right? Like, well, no, no, I wasn't. Yeah, I wasn't. Like yeah. Impending doom was coming no, in. And no. you, you were in the Matrix. You, I remember well, pictures of you with Ted Cruz saying he smelled like the Constitution. <laughs> No, what? Well, I wasn't. I, I didn't. I didn't have any fear of doom until I came back to the states. I came back in two. I left in two thousand three. Came back at the somewhere in two thousand seven. I hadn't discovered you yet. I think yet. Were you even on the air at that? When you went on the air in two thousand eight? Eight. Two thousand eight. Okay. okay, and so I hadn't found you yet. But then we had the big crash, and and I didn't know that there was stuff happening in the U.S. I wasn't paying attention to what was happening in the U.S. I was in England. And so I came back and then all of a sudden we had the big stock market crash and the real estate debacle. And I was like, wow, this is bad. I need, and I started looking around for how do you, how do you deal with something like this? And somehow I came across you, came across your show. I started listening to a few episodes here and there. I wasn't like hooked yet. Uh, but, um, and in fact, I thought this kind of weird. The shows that you, used to, you, you that you do when people would call in with a question or send their questions in, those shows I never listened to. It's like I don't care if that guy wants to know how to, you know, how to build a quail uh, house or whatever. I don't. I, I, so I never listened to those shows. I just listened to some of the interviews and some of your uh, shows where you had a specific topic. But as I got to know you better through the podcast, actually, those shows are now my favorite shows. You put a lot of, I know you, you have to put a lot of work in to answer some of those questions. I know you're not that damn smart that you can just do this stuff off the top of your head, but you are pretty damn close to a genius. I think your IQ is up there. Uh, I can't compete. So anyway, uh, that, um, so anyway, um, yeah, I, I, uh, started feeling like things are going to hell in a handbasket and I kept thinking, you know, the plane is about to crash, but if it could just miss the top of that mountaintop, where we could go another 500 uh, miles down the plate. I can, it would give me, maybe, maybe if it, it wouldn't crash this year, if it crashes two years from now, it'll give me enough time to try to start getting prepped up. Cause I wasn't a prepper. I didn't say my, I didn't say my food. Go ahead. I know you're about to say something. You're about to say something. Well, yeah. You know, the, the plane analogy, that was a big thing came from Glenn Beck. And I used to always liken that to like, there's people when they're watching their football team play a game and they're trying to kick a field goal they like all turn the label of their beer toward the TV as though that's going to influence the ball. And, and, and the analogy in of itself with, if you had more time, that would be good. It, that's not the flaw in it. The belief that paying attention to a thing or writing a letter or something was actually going to make the plane stay in the air. That was, that was the fallacy. Like the plane is either going to crash now or next week or next year. Or it's not going to crash at all. It's just going to kind of skid along and come to a, a rolling stop. It's going to do what it's going to do. And and, and the thing that you, you know, that, and this is a probably why you sleep a hell of a lot better 14 years later at night, is because what we, what we do here is we turn to the things we do control. So, like, that plane is going to do what that plane is going to do. But the shit you're doing in your life now, those are all things you tangibly control. And it may have actually been easier for you than for a lot of people because you had such an entrepreneurial background. So you were used to like, I made this thing happen. I think for a lot of people, the problem is if they've never done that, the idea that they can is far to them. do something. Yeah, well, yeah. And like what I can do is I can make the government do a thing, but I can't make a difference in my own life. And when you get to the other side of that, you realize how absolutely disconnected from reality that is. Well, but I mean, to be fair to you, some of the stuff y'all were doing, I know you and your wife were doing, were there were good things locally, like actually reading textbooks and seeing what kids were being taught. And like that's proven to be important a, a lot as of late. But there's so much of a limitation on that side. And I think probably your life got better when you started like the things that when you put 
a hundred percent effort into something, you got like a hundred percent result and said, I'm going to put a hundred percent effort in for 1% result. And it felt like that because, you know, when I came back, I felt like maybe I could do something on a, uh, in politics. So I got involved in a local party and I was a Republican. In fact, my wife was the first Republican ever to be elected to the registered deeds office since the county was formed in 1803. And uh, she came in in the Tea Party movement in 2010. They asked, actually asked me to run for that position. I said, hell no. My wife said, well, I'll do it. And she's been there ever since. But, um, you know, I was thinking that even though I was on one hand, I was like, like something's happening. Something bad's happening. I feel like I'm way behind. I'm running out of time. I'm not prepared. And I'm starting to listen to you and I'm starting to figure things out. But I'm also plugged into the matrix. You know, you remember you did run for an office as a libertarian. And you do say the difference between a libertarian and uh, anarchist is what, about six months? It's probably more like two it's years. It's six months depending on how many anarchists you talk to. The less anarchists yeah. you talk to, the quicker you'll become one. Two right. years, probably. Right. probably. Yeah, when you have anarchists telling you how fucking stupid you are all the time for being a libertarian, you tend to not want to be part of what they're doing. When you analyze it logically, it's about a six-month walk. And, you know, when I ran for LP, I was approached for it, and it paid $660 a month to be a Texas rep at that time. And I had my – that that was actually the end of all politics for me in reality because the the level of attack I got when I started to even show up on polls – was unbelievable. And I wasn't going to win. And I'm like, they're doing this just on the off chance that maybe, you know, I can pull an upset for a shitty state, a state house, like a state Senate position in Texas. You actually can get some things done. A single rep in Texas. I mean, you talk about peeing in the wind. That's all that it is. And what really did it for me was about a few months after that, the attorney that we had retained for one of our corporations heard me talking about it with my CFO and he walked over to me, put his hand on my shoulder in a very creepy, very, you know, paternal. <laughs> yeah. Like, like, like this deal with the devil type temptation. Like, well, if you want that seat and you're ready to run as a Republican, I can make it happen. And he didn't stutter. He wasn't kidding. And I told him, I said, at this one, I don't want a damn thing to do it. He said, well, that's too bad. We could do a lot of good things together. Now, like I said, that seat has no real power in of itself. But those seats, when you have the connected attached to them, all of a sudden you can get a lot of things done. And that's what his view was, is look what I could do if I get this guy that's already friendly to me on board with me. And uh, yeah, and I was done. I was like, well, that's how politics works over a $660 a month seat. Uh, with per diem for your hotel while you're in Austin once every two years. No, I don't want anything to do with this shit. Well, at least you guys only do it every two years. Yeah. I mean, uh, most states, it's every year, and they keep piling the crap on. So anyway, uh, the first time I, I don't know, you ever remember the first, do you remember the first time we actually met in person? I don't. I have here in my notes. It was in North Carolina at the Prepper Expo, at, uh, at Ron's Prepper Expo, but I, I don't remember meeting you there, actually. The first time I really remember meeting you, was I think the first workshop we did, first workshop we ever did here with the Hoogle Mounds. And I remember you coming here and bringing a canopy and stuff like that. I don't remember the expo. Yeah. Well, um, you had a, a little get together at a bar afterwards and I had my dad in tow with me and I remember talking to you and I remember talking politics. I'm like, now I look back and think, wow, he must think I'm such a, a retard. And how could, how could you be listening to me and want to talk this shit? Because people still have to make that journey. I mean, every every new person that logs in to your uh, show and listens to it, some of them are going to be shot because there's going to be cognitive dissonance. Uh, and then it's oh, time. we excel at some cognitive dissonance, bro. <laughs> we like people turn us on for the first time, and they're looking for I don't know Alex Jones on a podcast, or you know uh, how we're going to elect the next president that's going to save the world, or the resurrection of the Orange Man, or something, and. There's got to be like, a, oh, my God, this is not what I'm looking for. It, I guess it depends on the state, because what I've learned is a lot of people are in that state. At the same time, they want to learn how to grow their own food. They want to learn how to homestead. They want to learn how to run a business. So if they get plugged into that first, I don't think there's that much of a problem. I think the people that have the biggest negative reaction, the ones that find that first, and then sooner or later, they'll either listen to an old episode or will come up with an episode that talks about the current political climate from an anarchist standpoint. And then it's just like, I don't know, it's like 20 people scratching the chalkboard at the same time for them. They just can't handle it. 
And I get it. I mean, when I started the show, I was pretty anti-political, but I still voted because it was like wired into me, like you're supposed to vote. And I would just go vote third party just like to show like the middle finger, show them. And like, you know, along the way, it just all fell apart for me because every single thing that mattered was not connected to that world. And I let's kind of turn the corner here because that's what happened to you. And where, where did this lead you with some of the things and skills that you've developed? Because I pick on you because you're a pain in the ass at workshops, but I, I've actually been really impressed with the work that you've done and the things you've developed over the years that I've watched you do. Well, it's taken a while to get to the point where I even thought, could I be a guest on your show? Because I've, you know, I've wanted to, I've even, I've even said, even thought about it in the past, but I'm like, I don't really have a story to tell. I don't have, I'm not like the duck egg guy. Like that's John Daly's shirt. I'm pimping him today. Uh, you know, I don't have a specific claim to fame per, per se, but I started, I started looking this year at all the things that I've done. And, um, you know, by the way, when I met you, you were a men artist, you weren't total anarchist. So people come to you on a, when you're on a different, you, you've evolved over that 14 years. I would imagine that it's kind of weird, but with the, with things happening today, and I'll get to your question, the things happening today, people are coming onto your show. They're coming on at their spot. Maybe you're way advanced than where you were when I met you, but then they may be too, because there's been a lot of shit happening the last two years and people are starting to become aware. So it may be, a, it may, maybe the, it, it's still just as easy an on-ramp to make that transition. Uh, I just, you know, wished it would have been a little bit faster for me, but, uh, I was at a point, you know, you remember I, I started a podcast, that same, that same, um, prepper convention I, I met you at, uh, William Forston, the author of one second after about an EMP and it's set in that neighborhood over there and near Na Asheville. And, uh, I had started a podcast about the show revolution, which was, I thought about an EMP because the lights were going out and I took uh, me and my buddy said, Hey, let's do this fan cast podcast and let's talk about what happens when the lights go out? And so you've kind of ragged on me like, come on, Jake, that's a, a very small percentage uh, thing that you're prepping for. And you can't prep for something like that. You need to prep for the five things that people need to prep for. And then you'll be ready for almost anything. It's just how long can you go? But uh, I, uh, I, I came from that situation where I was thinking of the big things that were going to happen. But then I started doing things like the first thing I did when I moved back from England was I walked down the front door of my porch. My wife bought the house without me. She moved back six months before me. She bought a house in an HOA. We'd never been in an HOA. Um, and I didn't really know what, you know, that it was an evil thing. And it is, I would never go back in the HOA. And so anyway, she bought this nice little house in a, in a, a nice neighborhood. I walked out and my front yard was full of clover. And I, I was standing there, I thought, something is wrong. What's wrong with this scene? Um, there's something missing. And I, I finally realized there were no honeybees. When I was growing up as a kid, you walk out there, you could hear the buzz. It'd be full of honeybees. I thought, what in the hell is going on here? So I did a little research and I heard about, well, the bees might be, you know, getting, uh, having a hard time and, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 uh, the different theories they were having about why bees were, seemed like they were going away. And I, I decided at that point, you know, maybe I ought to be a beekeeper and, and help the bees. And, uh, but it took me five years before I pulled the trigger, but I became a beekeeper, started making, uh, started, uh, collecting honey. And I, I started rescuing bees and out of different structures, people would, I would find out about a, a bees in somebody's garage, et cetera. So I learned that skill. And then I started coming to your workshops and I started learning other skills. I learned how to can. My mom always can when I was a kid. My dad always had a, uh, a garden. We had a, a wood stove. So, you know, we were all, always hauling wood and going to get firewood. I mean, you know, you grew up, we grew up with a lot of those kind of skills, but you didn't value them as skills, it's kind of like what you did at your youth. It's just the way, the way you grew up. So I went back to some of that, uh, started canning food and then, uh, you know, started stacking food and then just started just, just the little things that you do along the way or how to make kombucha. Uh, and, and, uh, and then I started doing other things. Uh, every time I go to one of your workshops, I'm going to learn some kind of skill. But more than that, I'm going to meet some really cool people and network with people because we got a really good um, network here in Tennessee that 
TS, the Tennessee GSD crew, the Get Shit Done crew, Nicole and Night Hawk and, and Tactical Redneck and Sean Mills and a bunch of us, we get together on a regular basis and do stuff. And so uh, over that period of time, I've just continued to stack my skills, but nothing, you know, nothing you can point to and say, wow. But if I took you on a tour of my house and said, look at all the freeze dried food I've got on my shelves, you'd say, holy shit. I mean, um, I freeze dried over 450 pounds of ground beef. And, and that's just one thing I do raw. I, I freeze dry a gallon of raw milk every week to make, uh, um, you know, make milk powder and I make butter with the cream and, and I freeze it. And then I, I do uh, cheese and pork chops and all types of high caloric shit. I don't do shit like, uh, you know, gummy bears and Skittles like Nicole's doing. <laughs> I don't know if you know that. That's what she's doing now. Yeah, she's freeze drying candy. She's doing Skittles and candy corn and crap like that. Apparently, it's like she's selling a lot of it. Yeah. So what I was was impressed with you though is like you're not going to the store and buying a gallon of milk every week. You're getting milk from the Amish in a trade barter arrangement, and you actually made you know the economics of a freeze dryer make sense. Like you came up with a way to. First of all, you bought it used, so you didn't pay retail for it. Then you came up with ways to acquire product for no or reduced cost. Nicole yeah. kind of made hers work because she's, well, she'll sell anything effectively. No, I, and I don't, and, and they I kind don't of went in on it as a group, too. They didn't like yeah, one yeah. person going and buy a $5,000 machine. I'm like, if one, you know, if you want to put up some freeze dried food, you can put a lot of freeze dried food up for five grand. Somebody else did all the work. But y'all got both got in different ways creative with ways to make that pay off. No, nah, it's not five grand. It's about twenty five, twenty seven hundred. I got mine for twelve hundred. I had a, uh, I used a, a software program called IFTTT. If this, then that. Just to basically it cobbles together different uh, software packages, so I can make Craigslist send me an email anytime somebody posted a harvest right or freeze dryer, and I had that recipe set up. For over a year, it was live. I never got anything. And then about a year and a half, I got a hit on it. And somebody was selling almost a brand new freeze dryer for $1,200. And I bought it. Um, And I didn't really use it a whole lot at that point. I've used it. I played around with it and uh, whatnot. And then COVID hit. And in 2020, in March, when the shelves cleared out, like it was obvious that people were making a run on food. I mean, there was nothing. You couldn't get anything. I said, no, I need to I need to get serious about my food prep. I already had a lot of food, but I, I cranked up my freeze dry 24-7, and it's been running 24-7 ever since. One of the barter deals that I did was um, I met this couple that when COVID hit, they were supplying local restaurants with 50 to 60 dozen eggs a week, and all those restaurants shut down. They had nothing to do. They don't know what to do with those eggs, so they were like on next door trying to sell them. I made a deal with them and, and they didn't know anything about freeze dried eggs. And I, I, I gave them all the benefits and I said, look, if you'll give me some eggs that you're probably going to feed to your dogs anyway, I'll freeze dry them and I'll give you 25% of the eggs back. I'll, I, so if you'll get, so I, it takes 60 eggs on average to do a full load in my freeze dryer. And so uh, that's four quarts of eggs, basically what happens when it gets done. I gave them a quart and I kept three. So I'm getting 45 eggs a week for free. I did that for months and months and months. And then finally, we parted company. I think they had plenty or maybe they're back on their feet now and they don't want to keep doing that. But I got plenty of eggs on the shelf. And so I just looked for high caloric density type foods that in, in, the, in the long run, uh, if I needed to, I could have a, a meal every day with a, ground, with a pound of ground beef making spaghetti or chili or something for 450 something days. Uh, and I'm not going to do it every day. I'll probably, you know, you're not going to eat beef every single day like that. So uh, I, I got, you know, I subscribed to Butcher Box. I bought a, uh, I would have to say 2020 was my year of acquisition. I started really getting serious about making sure I, I had systems of redundancy. So like we're on HVAC. We've got a 5,000 square foot, uh, 100 year old schoolhouse that we renovated and live in. It's basically two houses in one, 3,000 on, on the schoolhouse side, and there's about 2,200 on the other side that's a mother in law apartment. And my mother in law actually lives in there. And so 
this 12 foot ceilings on my side of the house. It's hard as hell to keep the heat that place. My first electric bill when I, um, and I didn't have the, the water heater running, nothing. It was, uh, the, the place was uninsulated, but my, my, uh, uh, floor guy said, look, I got to get the temperature, you know, 72 degrees. And I need to leave it there so I can let the wood acclimate before I do any work. And I said, we're feeling good at 68 degrees. <laughs> he said, yeah, we can do that. It was $799 for my first electric bill. So I had to, uh, I had to do a lot of work. I, I did some spray foam insulation in that place. And now my electric bills are around 400 to 450 in the winter time. But then I decided, you know, I can't count on just electricity to heat my place. So I, I installed a thousand gallon propane tank. And then uh, I put in two fireplaces that run on propane. Then I, 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 I got rid of two, two electric water heaters and replaced it with an instant propane hot water heater. So I'm taking the, the load off of the electric grid and using propane. And then, um, and I got kind of lucky too. Uh, when I bought in, anytime you buy, uh, get a propane, the first time you get it, they generally give you some kind of introductory pricing. And I was able to get 89 cents a gallon. And I filled that sucker up. But over the course of the last year, prices have gone through the roof. This past summer, I was able to do a pre-buy for the year. And based on how much you've used, they can let you buy so much and go ahead and prepay it. I prepaid for 1800 gallon. I uh, paid $1,800. Oh, 1,800 gallons, excuse me, 1,800 gallons, and uh, I'm so glad I did that now because I still I still got about, I think, 800 or 1,200 gallons left before that I can have delivered prices, they say now, is a 10-year. You have holiday. a credit for that. You have a credit for yeah. that amount they owe you, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So I locked in my rate on that, so I'm just looking for things like that. I mean, you had a guy that had a brilliant idea that, called in or wrote in to you and said, hey, you know, I like your 12 gas can rotation um, for storing gas, but I just decided maybe I could get a bulk tank. He called his local co-op or something like that, and he got one. They actually provided the, the tank for free. Yeah, and we looked into it. We can't do it here because we don't use enough. Like, that's really more for farms and stuff like that where you got a tractor, you know, running on it. But we're, we're actually looking at, like, we might have to buy the tank but there's nothing that stops me from dumping gas in a tank every time I go to the, and then you, if you put the tank up on stilts, you got gravity, so you don't need power. And that might be the easiest way to store gas, even if you don't have that available. But if you're using enough, you can get a contract where the fuel truck comes by like once a month, fills it up and you pay a bill and you'll pay a little more than you will at the pump. But you know, well, what's the, what's the, what's the value of 500 gallons of gas? sitting yeah. there and constantly being rotated by somebody else's labor, right? Like, you know, I mean, so there's a lot yeah. of ways to, to, to do stuff like that. I actually pulled the trigger on that. I, um, and my co-op weren't going to give me a tank either. So I had to buy a tank and I, I bought a 550 gallon tank and which is the minimum 500 gallons is the minimum that they'll is the break point where they give you a little bit of reduction on the price per gallon. I didn't want to do a 200 or 250 or whatever. So I did a 550. I put an electric pump on it. Uh, it's run on 12 volt. I scavenged a couple of batteries off of a wheelchair. The guy across the street scrapped. He's like a 600 pound life guy. And uh, the batteries were still good. I guess the, the rest of the chair, had maybe the motor goofed up anyway. Um, and I'm uh, be, I'm going to be putting a, a solar panel on the top of my little shed. I'm building a shed around the, the gas pump. So it'll, um, but I can just put a, right now I just charge it up every now and then, but it doesn't use that much anyway. So now I got my own personal gas station. Co-op delivers non-ethanol fuel. And um, the last time I bought it, it was 309 a gallon. Right now it's like 311. And at the pump at Kroger, regular gas is about that price. So I'm okay, um, not bad on that, but I've got non-ethanol gas. I've also bought a 150-gallon diesel tank, which I did put on a, um, it's a, a gravity-fed system because I have a little diesel tractor. 150 gallons will probably last me three years for, for, for as much as I use that thing. Uh, so, yeah, I just, I'm, I, I do sleep better at night. And on top of that, I've got a bunch of 35-gallon, and 15 gallon uh, 
plastic barrels that I've just keep, kept filling up with gas. I probably got another 300 gallons in my shed. And so I'm just rotating that stuff and I'm putting stay bill in some of it. And then uh, I also have a, about an, an 83 uh, Land Cruiser this year, an FJ60. Out of, I bought it out of Honolulu and had it shipped over here. And it runs, it runs better on non-ethanol. And so, I mean, I'm getting it for about the same price. I, can, I mean, delivered to my house. Can't beat that. You know, you said 2020 was your year of acquisition. It was for a lot of us that had been living the lifestyle that we talk about here all the time, because if you had reserves, when everybody freaked out, they were buying shit you didn't need, which meant all the stuff that you wanted, not necessarily needed, went down in price. Like I bought a car pretty much for cash that that I bought for $24,000 at a dealer cost of 32. And it's sitting on lots right now that this, you know, one year newer, but for like 38, five and I bought it for 24 and it, you know, it was a sports car. It was a, it was a fun thing, but you know, I wanted one my whole life and I'm like, mm-hmm. you ain't going to get a brand new car for that price. You can't buy a freaking like Nissan Ultima stripped down for 24 grand and, I think, you know, that's just an example that there were so many cherry pick opportunities, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, right? It was like everybody freaked out and wanted to buy beans. And most of the people doing it didn't even know how to cook a dry bean. And then you could just walk in and buy a car that's damn near a $40,000 car for $24,000 if you had the money. And there was so many things like that. And then the thing I like about your, your freeze dryer story is, the number one ingredient in that story that resulted in you acquiring it for what you did was patience. You set that trigger alert up and you didn't go like, well, I'm not going to get one at that price. So let me go break out the Amex and pay four grand or three grand or whatever the hell they cost depending on size. You waited because you knew sooner or later, somebody would be like, why'd I buy this damn thing? And what can I get for it? And if you waited (laughs) long enough, then you get to capitalize on that other person's with Dave Ramsey. Remember Dave Ramsey? You mentioned him earlier called stupid tax. Right? Yeah. Like maybe it's not dumb to buy a freeze dryer, but it's dumb to not buy a freeze dryer without doing the math first and know what you're going to do with it. Because all of a sudden now you're sitting on a $2,500 desk paperweight. You don't know what to do with it. You, well, wait, I have to buy the food that goes in it. Like you had a plan and you had patience to wait for that plan to execute. Well, it's even, it's interesting. The person that did sell it, um, classic story they she was i finally deduced that she was getting a divorce from her husband they live way out in the country and inside a uh, a fence compound with two houses they had every prepper thing that you could ever want and never used it they had the glenn beck uh solar generator never been broke out of the box brand new this uh freeze dryer been used about three times look brand new so it looked like to me that that guy was one of the guys kind of like me that Felt like, oh, I discovered that shit's going to happen. I better get things in order. And they just started buying stuff. He had everything. I mean, and he wasn't around. And so they, she must have just said, yeah, we're getting rid of all this shit. And she's moving back to North Carolina. So I, I came out on top on that. I found another freeze dryer from another divorce that I bought for $1,200. And I held it for about a year. And then when COVID hit, I sold it for $2,300. People started bidding it up. And so technically... I've got my freeze drive for free. If you look at it from a I technically did nothing, work. no, you got your freeze drive for free. I'll, I'll say that flat out. If you did that, you got your freeze drive for free. Let's talk about what you're doing now. You have a business model where you're flipping raw land, and I, I've talked yeah, yeah. about that as an idea for a long time. How'd you get into that? How's it going? Um, okay. And what what what's working with it? What you know? What do you want to do better with it? I have to give a, a tribute another TSP member. Uh, for me le- even learning about this business model. Tim Flood, I don't know if you know Tim Flood. So Tim, he's down there near you somewhere. He's in Texas. Um, he was on Facebook on the Survival Podcast group and back when it was being used. And uh, he one day he just posted, well, I guess I'm gonna have to start flipping raw land for um, going into business for myself, flipping raw land because I just got laid off of my job. And uh, and people were got, well, I hope it works or congratulations. And, you know, hope, you know, so they were, I was like, you know me, my superpower is asking questions. And I said, wait a minute, what in the hell is flipping land? What does that mean? 
And he said, well, it's this. I said, well, what about this? And then we went private and started having a conversation. And then I said, look, Tim, I've got this webinar software. I can actually bring you on. This is before Zoom. I had the webinar jam. I said, look, I could bring you on like this right here. And can I interview you, just me and you, so I can record the conversation, I can learn how to do this? He goes, yeah, sure. But if you want to learn it, you can just go over here to uh, landacademy.com. I said, well, well, wait a minute. Are you telling me you didn't think up this idea? There's somebody else that's like teaching it? Is it kind of like a membership site or something? He goes, yeah, that's exactly what it is. And that's how I discovered it. And, um, and so I started listening to their podcasts and, and going online and, and looking at all their stuff. And they're the real deal. They've been doing it for like 20 years. They bought and sold over 15,000 properties, and they teach you how to actually do this business model. The guy that you had on about a month or so ago, that guy, he had like 700 properties in his uh, inventory. That's what he does. He's, it's the same exact model. He probably learned it from that same group. Um, I have a feeling, though, he's doing a lot of desert properties. To have that many properties, they're probably the really cheap properties that you can, you can buy desert property for fifty to a hundred dollars an acre. Yeah, I have a feeling he's buying like several hundred acres and chopping it into smaller pieces so people can afford it. I have Maybe that he's doing something like that because he has a lot of shit that's like one and eight, you know, one point eight acres, two point three acres, stuff like that. And honestly, I when I look occasionally, I look at it like West Texas and all. It's just it's too desert for me. But you don't see a lot of stuff under twenty five acres in, on those properties. Like people, they're like you, you go and like I can get five hundred acres for how much? Oh, it's there, you know. And it's like, yeah, no. Well, because I live in Tennessee, I started in Tennessee. So basically, the business model is you shotgun mail to anybody that has unimproved property. Now you can determine what size property you want to uh, go for. Do you want to go for? really small acreage near the cities like infill lots where you can maybe build a house on it or do you want rural property and that's what i like i like rural property so we were going for five acres and up whatever the up is it could be a three thousand part three thousand acre parcel i didn't care we were making offers for you know a couple of million dollars and if if they had accepted that offer i don't have two million dollars but i have a group of people that have money you never have a shortage of money in this uh, business model it's finding the deals and the deal flow is the work not finding the money to pay for it and so i mailed my first mailer out um about three years ago i sent it to dekalb county which is where nicole lives i didn't realize that but i found two parcels the first two parcels i bought one was 3296 dollars it was 4.3 acres and then the other parcel was 5.7 acres i paid 4029 for and I first got into this, a good buddy of mine who we're always talking about making money. He's an entrepreneur. I said, hey, Danny, um, I'm going to be doing this. You got to take a look at this. No, ain't nobody going to sell you land for 25 cents on the dollar. Are you nuts? I said, no, man, you need to go listen to these podcasts. I'm telling you, it's true. It actually works if you'll do it. Oh, bullshit. Anyway, when I, I bought those two properties, his eyes, uh, eyebrows went up. And then there was somebody else in that same mailer called me and said, hey, look, uh, you sent me two letters on two parcels I have, but I actually have four parcels. I want to sell all of them together. And it was going to be around 20 grand to buy it. And so I went with, with the Danny. I said, look, dude, I don't want to put 20 grand. You want to go in 50-50? Let's go. He said, yeah, let's go look at it. We went and looked at it. It didn't work out. But I said, hey, man, do you just want to go in business with me, 50-50 partners? Because he's a smart dude and he's also got resources. And he said, yeah. And he actually refunded me every uh, half of everything I'd paid into that point for the, for the land, for the mailers, for the membership, all of that. So we've been part of He bought point. into what you had had acquired at that point. So he, yep. he didn't just become a partner. He bought no. half yeah. the value of the business. Okay. Exactly. And so at that point, we started mailing, and we've had some home runs. With the, now, the two that we bought were actually in HOAs. <laughs> I'll never do that again. But we sat on them for about a year. I wound up selling the thirty-two, the the first one that we bought for thirty-two ninety-six. We sold it for eight thousand, and the second one we bought for four thousand twenty-nine. I sold it for twelve. So that it took a year to do that. But that's not our business model. Our business model is we want to turn it fast, like in a month or two. But even a year, what's the return on that investment? You can't get that in mutual funds, stock market. You might get it in Bitcoin. 
and you might not. Are you doing anything with this land at all to improve its value, or are you just flat flipping it? No, I, I, those I flipped. Uh, we bought 30 acres in Shelbyville. It was a perfect uh, developable property. It was a rectangle, had road frontage all the way down. It had power going right through the center of it. Uh, had water, had natural gas, um, had, I think, internet, just didn't have septic. Or, or, um, and so we cut that thing up into six five acre lots. We hired a perk guy to come out there. And out of the six lots, five of them perked. There was one he couldn't get a perk site on. So then we just took it and, 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 and smashed it against the next one. And so it was a 10 acre lot. We got into that. We bought that 30 acres for 40 grand. We, we spent 32,000 on, uh, forestry mulching, uh, survey and perk work and the commissions and closing costs and we sold out for 258,000. So we that was a home run. I don't know if you'll come across those every day. I will take one of those a year. <laughs> and uh and in fact, we probably could have made 360. We probably could have made an extra 100,000. It's just uh we couldn't get the perk guy to get out there. He's busy. I mean, you can't get those guys to work. They're too busy. They're like 3 or 4 months out. And three or four months out was in the middle of uh, 2019, and then fall came on, and then started raining, and then then his son died, who run who works in the business with him, and it just kept getting put off, and then 2020 hit. <laughs> so we, if we could have sold it back in 2019, there's no doubt I could have made an extra hundred grand on that property, but uh, we had to sell out and take what we could get. We did pretty good. Uh, we bought another piece of property for twenty thousand dollars. In Winchester, Tennessee, didn't do a thing to it, and uh, sold it for 140. Um, but we're looking at a piece of property right now. So right now, anybody, uh, you guys are. I just listed this, but if anybody's looking to, for a reason to come to Tennessee, you've been looking for. I want to get out of the big cities. Jack's taught me into it. I need to find me a place to build a cabin or build a homestead. I've got 18 acres down in Pulaski, Tennessee, which is seven minutes off of I-65 going towards uh down towards uh Huntsville, Alabama, just on the side of Tennessee line. Beautiful piece of property. Sits up on a hill. Uh it's eighteen acres, but we had the surveyor. We wanted we said shoot us a line and split that thing in half if we want to divide it and sell it in two parcels. And he did. We hadn't recorded that way. It's still one parcel, but we can do it that way. And then we had the uh, perk work done and we had two four bedroom sites. Um, so technically we could sell two nine acre lots with a four bedroom house site on it, or you could buy it 18 acres and, and build you a compound or build one house and sell off the other half and get part of your money back. But it's a, so it's on top of a hill. The, uh, it's a big hill. It takes, uh, actually right now it takes a four wheel drive to get up that hill as a driveway up there. But it's a beautiful piece of property if somebody wants to. It's got plenty of room up the top. A guy lived up there for 14 years in an RV, and he kept it like a big yard. And it's I don't know. I put a I put a YouTube video out there. If you're on if you're on Telegram channels, it's on there. You can go check it out. Or if you want to list it on your um, if you want to list it for your your for our folks that want to take a shot at it, I've got a YouTube video a tour that I did in my four wheel drive. I just drove around and, and narrated. But yeah, on that one, we thought about doing other stuff. We, we kept, we, we, if we go whole hog on that, we would put another driveway in on the other half of the property. So if we cut it in half, it's got two props. This got a driveway over here. We can put another driveway over here for about 10,000 with new gravel and culverts and whole nine yards. And then, then two people could have two private drives in a very secluded, on a hilltop, there's two springs at the bottom of this thing. It's out in the country. It's a picture postcard. It looks out over on the backside of it at the top of the hill, 250-acre uh, cow farm. So there's beautiful views on the back. So it's really secluded. Anyway, yeah, we look for opportunities where we can, if it makes sense, to improve a piece of property that way. You, there's a, there isn't such a thing as a best use. I mean, I, I heard about a guy who bought wetlands. You can't do anything with wetlands, but he bought it with the idea that county government had a program to buy wetlands so that they could use it in this kind of like a carbon swap, but it was like wetland swap. So if a guy wanted to build a big mall over here or, or something commercial that's going to create 
uh, uh, revenue stream for the county government with taxes and it happens to encroach on a wetlands, as long as the guy would buy some wetlands over here to replace it, these guys bought this wetland dirt cheap and sold it to the county for $45,000 an acre. I'd like to get in on some of that action, but that's probably few and far between. How are you oh. finding this land? You're saying you're sending out shotgun mailers like everybody, but where where are you starting with it? Because this is obviously not land you're looking on Realtor.com or Zillow. No, for. you can't right. do that. That's how you sell it. It's not how you buy it. Yeah, yeah. people, you're you're actually buying property from people that are not they don't have it up for sale. Uh, we use data and we use online tools. In fact, when I'm, I'm going to be doing a session at your next workshop on how to vet property in your underwear, you know, sitting at home in front of your laptop uh, using uh, different uh, 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 different tools. So all of the there's 3,300 counties in the U.S. and all of the property assessors keep their data and their own database. But there are big data companies who have contracted Black Knight. Logic is one of them. Uh, there's about three different companies. Data Tree is another, and they contract with these different uh, assessors, and they buy their data and they aggregate it into their database. And what's weird is, is that if you look at Tennessee's uh, database and pull property in Tennessee, and then I compare it to the property that I pull in Terrington. Was it you're in Terrington? What's the name of your county? I'm in Tarrant. Tarrant. Yep. Tarrant. So if I pull if I pull data from that county, there's about 330 fields of data that you can get back. Some of the data that my assessor is going to keep, yours is not, and vice versa. So these guys keep it all, and then you can go in and say, uh, data tree, show me any property in Rutherford County between five acres and 17 and and, and, and a half acres, and and I want it unimproved. I don't want any structures on it unimproved property and it'll send me every single parcel back and do that data query. I can download it. I'll have all of the assessor data information, which includes the owner and their mailing address and the property address and all that. So then you can take all of that data. So you massage the data and figure out how much do I want to offer per acre in this county? Or do I want to get granular and get down to the zip code level? Or do I even want to get down even uh, to the APN scheme and the way the uh, county lays out their uh, their their uh, assessment data map is small squares, and each square has its own prefix, and you can literally get down to neighborhood pricing if you want to. And then you figure out, okay, the going rate is about five thousand an acre in this area. I'm going to offer twelve hundred fifty. I'm going to offer twenty five to thirty five percent of it, and uh, and so you'll send out, you know, our last mailer, we sent out 13,000 mailers, 13,600 mailers to uh, uh, Chattanooga, Hamilton County, and about five surrounding counties. And we got a ton of data, a ton of people coming back to us, a lot of more landlocked and, and mountain properties, which if it's a landlocked property, unless you've got the cojones and you've got the specialized knowledge in a, a, an attorney with nine inch uh, teeth, then it doesn't make sense to, to try to fool with those. But it's a numbers game because you're smelling the people that they own the land. And it's like, oh, uh, I've been paying on the taxes for 22 years, or I inherited this from my dad, and then I didn't even know he had owned the property until I got notified from the estate. And I don't want to do anything with it. I live in Portland. I'm a soy boy. I'm out there protesting the police every night. I'm never going back to that redneck area in Tennessee. And they get a letter from me saying, I'll buy your property for this amount of money. Like, sold. Easy button. And uh, and they sell it. People can't believe people will sell a piece of property that cheap. And you ask, well, why would they? And, and it's, it's really the same concept as going to a yard sale. Have you ever get, do you ever go to yard sales, Jack? I don't. I have enough shit. But I, I get what you're saying. I mean, the other side of it is if they have no idea really what it's worth, it's just something that's there and they have no emotional attachment to it. Uh, that's, the big thing. that's the big thing. Like when I'm dealing with real estate myself, as soon as I realize the seller has an emotional attachment to the property, I'm out, I'm done. I don't even want to talk to you anymore. Like I know that we're never going to come to a reasonable negotiated rate because you're pricing in things in your head versus things in the value of the property. But when you get somebody with no emotional attachment, 
even if they think, well, maybe I can get, you know, like you're offering, let's say four grand for property. They're thinking, well, maybe I can get six, but I can get four right now. I don't have to do jack shit. That thing's, and they're like, well, who would I contact? Like it's five states away or whatever. And like, mm -hmm. this man's going to give me a check and I can stop paying the county bill. Fine. Uh, and yep. and if, if, if they just happen on that day, be like, I need a new transmission to my car or something. Well, then it's like, oh, it's a sign. It's a sign from God that I'm supposed to sell my land or something, you know, or whatever, or from the soy God or whatever. Like it's time to sell. And if that happens, you know, and so you, like you said, you sell out 13,000, which means the vast majority are no's. Yep. But that's, yep. that's sales. That's just sales in reverse. It's sales as a buyer, right? Like you're basically selling somebody on the concept of selling you their property for less than it's worth. Yeah. Yeah. And that's just that's just a numbers game. The bigger the funnel, the more pops out the other end. And what pops out the other end, then we filter what pops out into what actually works for us. It's yeah. exactly the same as the sales process. It, it is exactly the same. And it's, and it's even um, it's probably even more than you know about that, because um, I actually had a guy that said you were an answer to my prayers. He had his how he had his land listed for two years trying to sell it. The first one I bought is the very first property I bought, and he tried to get me to raise my price to five thousand, and I got to looking at the price like I don't know, man. I don't, I, I don't think I think I'm gonna have a hard time billing on it. It's slope on the back of it, and he finally came back and said, "Okay, I'll just take your offer." And even then, I was like, "I don't know." <laughs> uh, but when he finally closed the deal, I met him at my bank so we could notarize a signature. I did a self close, and he said, uh, "You know, you're actually an answer to my prayer." I had made a maybe not a prayer, but he had made a new year's resolution that he's going to sell that property no matter what this year he wanted to get it done and then my letter came in he said it's like divine intervention but um yeah there are people out there that when you when you send out thirteen thousand letters it's better than sales because they don't most of the no's are like they wad your letter up and throw it in the trash can now there is a handful of people that get so pissed off at your offer that they will call you and cuss you out say nasty stuff or they'll take the time to take your letter and put it in a new envelope and put a, a stamp on it and write, why did you waste your time sending me this letter? Waste your stamp. I'm like, okay, you just wasted one too. But I don't, I call those hate calls. We, we, um, we, we spell it H A I G H T hate calls for fun. And, uh, and I had some good ones. Um, I had a guy literally call me up and he said, uh, so did you just offer me, this twelve thousand or one hundred twenty thousand? I said oh, it's actually twelve thousand. Okay, I want to make sure about that. So if you're here right now, I'd cut your nuts off and hang them up to dry. <laughs> uh, but I've learned that it is Tennessee. Yeah, yeah. it is Tennessee. I mean, <laughs> but I, I have had some fun. Uh, but what I've also found is it is a sales it is a sales process because I don't get upset about those. I don't care if they cuss me out. The only thing that would ever bother me if a guy threatened me. I had one guy threaten to come to my next time. If I ever contact him, he threatened me. I said, what are you going to do? I wanted him to say it because I was recording the phone call. <laughs> I don't think he had the, uh, the cojones to actually do it, but most of the, I just take it and uh, let it roll off my back. And when somebody starts asking, why are you sending me this? I said, look, I'm not sending it for you. This wasn't directed to you. You know how I'm going to send it to? I'm sending it to that guy that, he live, he's a soy boy that lives in Portland and he's protesting the police uh, every night, throwing firebombs at him. And his dad bought the property in Tennessee and left it to him in his will. And he thinks we're rednecks and he's never going to come out here and do anything with this land. So, so look, if I buy that land from him for 25 cents on a dollar, I can sell it to you for 75 cents on a dollar. And we both come out and somebody's going to actually use the land and appreciate it. I'm buying it from people like that. And they're oh, OK. And they, you know, go about their business. I've had other investors who call me and said, are you really buying land this cheap? And I said, well, are you wanting to sell? And he goes, no, but uh, if you ever get some land like that, I'd like to buy land like that. I said, well, let me ask you this. If I buy that land like that from somebody else, would you be willing to buy it for 75 cents on the dollar? Do you buy land? He goes, yeah. So I actually start building a buyer's list of people who are interested in uh, a deal on land, and, and they're happy to get it for 75 cents on the dollar. We both come out ahead. So I just use that. Uh, you know, I'll take advantage of the yard sale concept of you walk up to a yard sale and find a $100 uh, tool, a DeWalt tool for that's worth $100, like, and he's got marked for 10 
why the heck would he sell it for ten? Because he don't want it. He wants to get rid of it. Because he needs ten dollars. He needs ten dollars more than he needs a tool and doesn't have a buyer. That, that's pretty simple. Now, with all this shit going on, you're going to start jacking around with cattle. What's, what's made you decide that all of a sudden you won't be a cattle baron? Well, Trump talked me into it. Can you see that? I thought I would trigger a few people. Like, Make America graze again. I almost was going to name my. Um, Just YouTube. keep going. I got my own red hat. I'll be right back. You go ahead. Okay. <laughs> so I almost thought about going with that slogan. I'm going to vlog this idea. I'm going to start up a cattle operation. I'm going to vlog it. I'm going to turn it into a YouTube channel because, you know, I don't hate money and eventually it could turn into something. And I went to a field day where a particular breed that I'm interested in and the guy was giving these hats away. And so, like, because <laughs> this is making Those of you on the audio only i have a red hat that looks like a maga hat and it says relax idiots it's just a fucking hat we actually and have I, these for sale in the tsp gear shop okay and i i put on a red hat sorry for you guys on the uh, podcast it says make america graze again and i got this at a a, a field day for a, a a particular breed of cow that i want to get and the guy was giving them away. And I actually triggered somebody within 30 minutes of leaving that event. I was driving down the interstate. I put the hat on. I was doing a selfie. And this lady pulled, I pulled up next to this lady. And she, I look over. She's like cussing me. And her arms are flailing. And because, you know, they're triggered, right? It's funny. But, uh, yeah. Um, so about 10 years ago, my friend Danny, who's my business partner now, we had talked about jacking around with cows back then. And we actually looked at a... Um, um a, a farm that a guy had that he was leasing he had cattle on it and he had it pimped out it was cross paddock at water points all this stuff and um he sold all his cows due to a drought and he wanted to sublease it we came real close but we didn't do it i discovered back then i discovered a a, a breed of cow coming out of, of uh england called red um red gummit what's the name of it red devons and they're they're a short legged cow, heritage cow, smaller body. Uh, they do they they actually marble up and finish on grass really well, which is very unique. Uh, they were almost extinct, and this guy in Tennessee and a couple other guys single handedly saved that breed from extinction. There was like six hundred of those things left on the planet Earth, and then they brought it back. And we were trying to figure out how we could get in the cattle business and get some red devons. The guy had like fifty head over here close to me. We just never pulled the trigger, and we talked about it. He grew up around cows. His father-in-law had them. He helped his father-in-law. So this past year or so, he bought some land and built a house on it. And then he called me up one day. He goes, you know, between my house and my bro my son bought some land next to me. We've got about 22 acres. I think I could put a fence up and put some cows out there. And um, and so I uh, I thought, I wonder if I can get any cows on my property. i got five acres out in the country, but I don't have any forage. i got a front yard. I said, crap, that ain't going to work. I literally stopped across the street from my neighbor because they have a farm. And the, the guy had passed away about three years ago from cancer. I moved there in 2015. And I went over there probably a half dozen times just to introduce myself to the guy. He was never well enough to even come to the door. And I never met him. And he passed away. But I met his wife. And I stopped in. And I said, hey, uh, Miss Vicky, I said, uh, me and my partner buddy are thinking about raising some cattle. We're looking for a place to put some. I was wondering if I could make an arrangement with you. Long story short, Jack, she has 53 acre, totally perimeter fence, woven wire fence, a barn, small pond, and uh, only thing that's happening on it, she's got a deer hunter up there that that deer hunts, and he bush hogs it about twice a year. And um, and so she said, well, uh, maybe. Uh, but the fence is in bad shape. I said, don't worry about it. I'll fix the fence. I'll fix your barn. I'll keep the property. I'm going to improve your property. Um, uh, we did went back and forth. We came up with a written agreement. She's let me use her farm at no cost. And she's literally, I, and I said, so you're willing to do this? She goes, yeah. I said, well, I came back a, a couple of days later. I said, look, how long are you willing to do this? Because if I come out and put you know, fix the fence and do all the stuff and put cows on it. And then two years from now, you say, I don't want to do it anymore. Uh, I'm going to be kind of stuck. And she said, oh, no, if we go forward with this, you can do it for the rest of, of my life as long as I'm alive. And my daughter is going to get this farm. And she lives with me. And 
when we get together and do this, I want her in on this because she'll let you do it for her life. And they don't want to sell the farm. And so uh, we came up with a, a written agreement. And I have access. And it's literally, I can drive out of my driveway, cross the road into her son's driveway, back to a, a gate. I got a key to the gate. And I got a 53-acre farm over there at my access. I can do whatever I want to with it. So I thought I was going to put cows on it this year. This was back in February when we struck this deal. And um, it's just, and I asked her when I said, well, why do you, why are you letting me do this? Why do you care? For, uh, uh? She said, well, because I'm just glad somebody's doing something positive with it. And it's not growing up into a jungle like it is right now. And literally, I've got a lot to go. I've talked to Greg Judy. I've talked to Joe Salatin. There's a lot of work to be done. It's full of little bitty cedars, maybe this high up to five or six feet. I mean, thousands of them. So i got to deal with that. I can't even put cows on right now. The, 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 I've learned through my research that there's not enough good forage to put, especially a mama cow with a baby. Can't do cow-calf pairs. Maybe a, what they call a dry cow that's not uh, feeding another cow. And so I'm going to have to start with probably goats and sheep. Uh, I, so I was going to go with I've got my logo, I've got my idea, I'm going to vlog it on uh, YouTube and, 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 you know, make a deal of, uh, on that way. And I thought, you know, cow, uh, Startup Cattle is my name. But now I'm thinking I need to change it to Startup Cattle and other remnants. Goat Rancher. Huh? Goat Rancher. Yeah, but I'm not going to stay as a goat rancher. That's yeah, the thing. That's why I, I probably, I'm probably going to pick your brain at the work shop on, uh, uh, shop on this for you and Nicole about you know how to what may be the best approach because i almost want to do startup cattle and other ruminants so it covers goats and sheep because i can't put i'm going to put cattle on it. that's what my main goal is but i got to start back here it's like the more research i did the more of a rabbit hole i went into the holy cow there's a lot of work to be done i've got to i got to solve my water problem she's got a small pond about 25 foot in diameter holds about thirty thousand gallons and it's not in the best location now my neighbor just to the east of me has a four and a half acre pond full of water and it's 30 feet uphill from anywhere I need water. And so I struck a deal with him to siphon water off of that pond. And I'm going to show you how I use some of the tools I did uh, to vet the property on uh, elevation and stuff. I figured out how much line I needed for siphon hose and I bought some cheap um, uh, hose that, uh, that I could use for irrigation hose made me an intake, put it up there, and filled that little pond up in about three days. So I know the concept works. The cattle came in there, his cows, he doesn't do like Greg G. He doesn't fence his cows out of a pond. If you guys are going to have cows and you're going to have a pond, don't let your cows get in the pond. They ruin the pond. They spike it, kill all the fish, poop, and pee in it. And then it's just bad, bad all around. They erode the edge of the pond. They, uh, Greg G's working on one right now. The 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 the, the dam wall side of it is about to erode and, and break through because the cows have done so much damage. And so they came in there and stomped all over my broke my intake and stomped the hose to a, uh, flat as a fritter. I got to come. I'm going to trench a, a hose in. But uh, my goal is to. There's another area that looked like an old pond that'll hold about 200,000 gallons. And if I can uh, make that thing hold water, I, I, I asked you that question one time. Is There's this old pond area and it's got some trees growing up in it. Should I leave the trees standing, cut the limbs off of them and let the trunk stay in there for like a, a, a fish habitat? And you didn't really think that was a good idea, but... Um, well, because I don't think the pond will hold. I think trees for fish habitat's a wonderful idea, but I don't think... A, an impounded pond like that with trees breaking through the impoundment is probably not going to hold. Uh, That's know. why it ain't that. I don't think it, I think it's a fine idea. I just don't think it's going to hold. Give me, give me a little break here. I got a... Okay, guys, I didn't want to blow my nose right in front of you, but I appreciate you giving me some prophecy. Anyway, um, so I'm going, I'm backing up further. Like, I went ahead and bought all my equipment to put in electric fencing, and the supply chain, the struggle is real. Uh, I went to buy 
electric fencing, the reels and the, the, the fence post, the step in fiberglass fence post. Greg, Judy uses those. Um, you couldn't get them anywhere. And all of them said they'll be here in June. And I got June ro roll around. Well, it's going to be a couple more months. I finally got them. So even if I hadn't been able to get cows, I wouldn't have been able to manage them. So I've got my equipment. I just got to start putting these things together. And, uh, you know, I don't know if you know, but Dr. Dr. Barry is doing sheep now. Uh, and, and so I, uh, he's basically saying, Jay, just go ahead and get some goats, man. You don't need to build a pond for goats. They don't drink that much water. Sheep don't drink that much water. You can just fill up a tub and you don't need to do it, but every three or four days. I said, okay, that makes sense. I'm going to go ahead and pull the trigger and get the goats going. I would do something, get something going and try to improve a piece at a time. And then as you get four or five acres kind of rehab, you can bring some, a small amount of head onto that and then move the goats. And then you can, I mean, you do, we'll, we'll get into that later. I'm sure all, yeah, these, I, all I, you I, people, including this guy, I think you can come to the workshop and pick my brain. That usually involves with Jake far more hours, time, and alcohol than I need to be putting in my body at this point. But, uh, <laughs> I think you yeah. owe me a consultation, though. I think I bartered for one on the barter blanket at one point. I never think. Your statute of sure. limitations has expired at this okay. point. Okay. We'll, we'll see. All right. Um, anyway, um, you're going to do this on YouTube and all. We know that. Let's kind of wrap up here because we're over an hour now. Um, in all these different things you've done, you've had to have had some things that didn't go the way you expected or whatever. Kind of talk about that from a standpoint of where do you think people hit blind spots in trying to do, you know, all of these things? I think part of it is just trying to like, they listen to you talk about all the things you've done and they're like, oh, I'm going to go I'll do all that. 14 freaking years, people, right? It wasn't done in 14 days. Exactly. Um, that would be one of them. Is there any other thing you think really kind of jacks with people when they're trying to get their lifestyle into a more resilient, you know, self-sufficient manner. Yeah. They're friends and family that don't understand that they, uh, you know, they, people are so, um, they're, they're dependent almost on what other people think. And I don't really give a shit what other people think. You know that, uh, I, I get picked on a lot at your workshops, but that's the reason you guys probably do it. You deserve it. But you deserve it. Like, <laughs> you know, I'm not going to say what happened. One thing you said, like, I was the cat that got kicked after work. And I'm like, you were, but sometimes the cat crapped on the rug, you know? <laughs> and, but no, you, you, we, 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 it wouldn't be the same without you. Once we shot you a few years ago, you've been a great citizen at the workshops ever since then. All it took was shooting you. I should have figured that out, you know, eight years ago. It would have been great. And we all go through an uh, evolution, you know, maybe I've matured a little bit since then, but um, anyway, yeah, I was, I look back now, how damn ob obnoxious was that? I know it was, but somebody's got to ask the question. But I will say that what stops people, I think a lot of times is they don't believe they can do it and they're afraid to ask somebody to teach them. And that's why I'm, your show is so important because you got people coming on saying, I this is what I did. I built, I put quail in my garage and I got 20,000 eggs a year and somebody, and then you can go to their website or maybe they've got a blog or, or blog or YouTube channel. And then YouTube's a great uh, teacher. So, so people just need permission sometimes. And uh, you can't let your family and your friends, like my wife wasn't on board with prepping back in those days, but she is now. She's the one, she's the one that made me buy an EMP proof vehicle. Like, come on, honey, that's not going to happen. But she's now figuring stuff out and she's wagging behind me. So, well, what if an EMP has it? It ain't going to. And if it does, it doesn't really matter. We got bigger fish to fry and whether or not we got a, a vehicle to drive. So that's why I can sleep at night because I used to be like that. I used to be that kind of, um, but I think that's what holds people back is they're, um, they're worried about what their family says. Their family, dogs them about it and they listen don't listen to people just do your own stuff get and get with a group of people who will do it if you're in tennessee find us on facebook the tennessee gsd crew and learn about it and join up find the freedom cells that are that john bush has launched we've got a few of them in tennessee um and get involved and just do it i don't know uh i don't think anybody listening to this podcast falls in that in that category right maybe somebody's going to happen across this podcast in the future and maybe somebody will send this link out to somebody. Look what this guy's done in 14 years. I don't really think I've, I mean, I've done a lot of other stuff, you know, I've, uh, that we haven't talked about. Um, 
but um but I, and I don't I can't remember everything that I've done you know it's just you start doing that stuff you start stacking up your skills this year I bought a chainsaw and then I started watching YouTube and went down that rabbit hole on how to cut down a tree it's, it's a real simple process there's actually you know you you cut a lateral start you cut a notch out and you cut it on the back like, I never knew that um but I need to have a chainsaw for this farm that I'm working on because there's a lot of blowdowns and I need to get that stuff out of the way because it, it takes up valuable pasture space what I will do though I will ask you uh once I get things launched I really I want to put about 30 uh, 30 episodes in the can for YouTube so I can launch one every day and have like a major launch I've got a, a business side a business plan on how I want to get that thing launched I don't want to just start doing it and do a video here and do a video there and, and I've been I've, I've listened to about 400 uh, podcast episodes on how to launch a YouTube channel. I think when you say what you know, what's your skill, Jacob? How, how did you? How were you able to do this? I like to learn, and I'm not afraid to ask questions, but I also like to learn and just I find the expert that I can learn from, either through books. Love reading books. I probably got 700 books in my library, and they're all nonfiction. It's all how-to, marketing, and leadership skills, and self-improvement and you know uh, economics and all of that stuff and i read and read and read and listen and, and i'm out more now more than ever i'm probably youtube because you can find everything you need on youtube it seems like so i don't know if that answers your question no it does i just say there is a point where you, you know you learn as much as you can but then pull the damn trigger make shit happen get shit done we have people ask what does gsd mean it means get shit done it's something that goes way back with this community um I guess now that's got to go back six years or more uh, that we kind of, you know, like a German shepherd dog. Well, it means that too, but we're not talking <laughs> about that. Right. We're talking about getting shit done. Anyway, Jake, you've got a website uh, with your land flipping. It's called bye bye land. And it's not BYE. It's B U Y B U Y land.com. And then Jake actually, you know, pays attention. So, he sent me like every social media uh, website that he's on, all the communities in, everything like that. I've got that all in the show notes for people so that they'll be able to find it. If you're yeah. watching this on YouTube right now in the live stream, then this isn't true yet. But very shortly after this live stream ends, there's a link in the video notes that goes to the podcast notes for this with the audio file and all the other stuff that's involved. And everything is there. Uh, and we'll be there for those that are watching it later. So, Jake, man, it was, uh, it was a good interview, you know. Uh, we do pick on you sometimes, but that's because it's uh, it's easy and deserved. Uh, but but we do love you, and uh, I appreciate you being with us today. And I think it's important to bring people on like yourself every once in a while. Like you said, I don't have, like, a thing that I'm known for or whatever. I don't care. What, what I really try to do is make sure at least maybe once every month or two we're bringing somebody on It's just – Somebody that decided I'm going to do this thing or this group of things and they get it done. And I think that is inspirational because like, you know, it, it, there is something about people looking at somebody and just thinking, well, if they did it, then I can do it. And that's not always going to happen for people. They might say, well, because he did, doesn't mean I can do it. But if they, if they see it enough times, they'll pick a thing and a person that, that they want to emulate. Well, if he can do that thing, I probably, I, I, I think I could have done that anyway. And the fact that this guy did it, now I know I can do it. And I think it for most people, it's the one. You pick one thing, you do it, you actually surprise yourself, you get it done, and then you're like, well, what can I do next? And the confidence, every time you take a step, that confidence goes up, just like a baby learning how to walk. They take the first few steps, they fall on their butt, and you know their butt's low to the ground so they don't get hurt. And they're like, well, that was cool. you know. And then the next thing you know, they're running. And you have to start protecting them from killing themselves. And I think we as preppers and homesteaders, we can get into that too. We start hitting sharp corners because we move a little too fast. And I think that comes from doing too many things at once. But I'd rather rein somebody in from activity than try to get them up off the ground. That zero to one is the most important move that people can make. And it's true. And it's it's a universal truth. So if you look at something like totally dis disconnected from this, like Bitcoin, going from zero to one, an absolute scarcity you know, controlled, secure thing. Everything after that was was really easy compared to going from zero to one. A new homesteader building that first project or getting that first livestock, whether it's just chickens or quail or whatever, 
zero to one. And then everything else is much easier. Like even if it's physically harder, it takes longer, costs more money, takes more time. In here, it's easier because I already did a thing I didn't think I could do. And so I appreciate you coming on, sharing you know, your story of zero to one and then everything that came after it. Well, I hope that um, I can come back when I've got my YouTube ready, ready to launch, where I've got it done and I've got stuff to show. And, and I'd, like, I'd, I'd love to come back if you ever have, have an opportunity to do that and talk about the, uh, the cattle operation when I get to a point where I feel like, hey, the world needs to know about this now. Well, again, I appreciate it. Uh, thanks for being on with us today. Thanks, Jack. Appreciate it, brother.